Hey guys, Mr. Morrison back here with you, continuing our journey through World War II. Uh, today we're getting into the Holocaust. Um, not one of the brightest points of history. In fact, pretty dark. Not a fun one to go through, but definitely one we need to remember. Um, I just want to make a point before we go through this. We tend to think sometimes about history and events in history as, you know, we're smarter than that. We're more civilized than that. Uh, we could never do that. That was a long time ago. There are people alive today who survived, who lived through the Holocaust. So within current lifetimes, this happened. Um, this is not something that's a long time ago. This is something that our world is capable of. Our world did. Um, this is why it's important to study history, to know history, to know why things happen so that we can look for that again and not let those things happen again. Um, so this is something we're going through today. You're all going to get something different out of it. Uh, you're going to have different emotions, different things that stick with you, different images that you're going to want to get out of your head. Um, whatever you take from this, that's what I want you to take. That's what helps us remember. Um, real quick, uh, before I punch through these slides, um, the word Holocaust, um, I realized that I don't know. I didn't know until I looked it up. Uh, where that actually came from. Teachers don't know everything. Um, we hear the word Holocaust and we automatically think of this time during World War II and the, the massacre of the Jews. Um, but it actually goes back much farther than that. Not uncoincidentally, um, it was a biblical word, a Jewish word uh, that they used when they had burnt offerings, when they sacrificed animals and burnt them on an altar or burnt harvest on the altar um, as, as a symbol uh, to their God. Uh, so this is one of their words that now has been taken and turned into one of tragedy. Um, it was actually used in the year 1189. Um, so going back 750-ish years before the Holocaust we think of, um, a British writer used it in context with the mass killing of Jews in London. Uh, 1189. So it's been around a long time. Um, so that's where the word comes from. It's really gotten most of its meaning for us today from the World War II period in history. Um, and that's what we're talking about today. So let's set the stage. All right, I want you to know how, where this comes from. If you have not done uh, the before the Holocaust assignment that I had us do as a class, check that out. Um, this anti-Semitism, this hatred for the Jews did not start with a snap of a finger at World War II. Uh, we know about the, the rise of Hitler, and this was brought up with him. This propaganda came up with him, and even much longer before that in Europe. So check that out um, so you can understand where this event actually got its deep-rooted seeds uh, from. So we know about the rise of Hitler. Um, as a part of his vision, the Nazi vision for the Europe, for Europe, the Nazis proposed a new racial order, which of course put them on top. Um, they proclaimed that Germans to be the master race or the Aryan race, which incidentally is kind of a misuse of the term Aryan. Um, it comes from other meanings, but it's maybe it sounded good. That's why they took it. I don't know what their what their total purposes were for it. That's something you can look up. But they called themselves the Aryan race and used that to mean that they were the perfect race, the unblemished, the pure. All non-Aryans, particularly as we know the Jewish people, were considered to be inferior. And this propaganda, we know that propaganda is a dangerous thing that gets someone to believe only one side. This propaganda led to what we now know to be the Holocaust. So the Holocaust got its beginnings uh, with something called the Nuremberg Laws. Um, there was a government conference in the city of Nuremberg, and they came up with this chart, uh, basically a description of how pure your blood was. So Hitler used European hatred for the Jews that went back centuries, and for these charts, this ancestry went back several generations. He turned his hatred into government policy. Um, Anti-Semitism, this hatred for the Jews, was now not only legal, but mandated. Uh, it was required by German citizens. The Nuremberg Laws of 1935 denied Jewish German citizenship, marriage between Jew and non-Jew, and work opportunities for Jewish people. Um, if you look at this chart here, over on the left, 
Like that's where you're pure. If you're a pure German, then you're part of the master race. As you get farther to the right, mixed, mixed, Jew, Jew, you were, you were stripped of all of your rights of citizenship and you weren't allowed to do things. Uh, this was basically what you carried with you, um, either figuratively or, or literally to show that you're, what your racial background was. Let's watch this little video for a second. It'll kind of give you an idea of, of what was going on in the people's minds then. Germany, 1933. The Nazi Party, led by Adolf Hitler, seizes control of the democratic Weimar Republic. The country is transformed overnight into a police state. Basic rights and freedoms are revoked. The first concentration camps are established, imprisoning political enemies, homosexuals, and Jehovah's Witnesses. Hitler creates a propaganda campaign based on the purity and superiority of the Aryan race. His racist ideology infiltrated every level of society. His racist ideology infiltrated Jews are every labeled level as impure and are excluded from mainstream German society. Jews they are, are randomly as attacked in the streets and are excluded from mainstream German society. The Nazi party calls for a boycott of Jewish stores and businesses. In the streets. On September 15, 1935, the, the German parliament passed the Nuremberg Race Laws. The Nuremberg Laws makes racism, and in particular anti-Semitism, legal in Germany. The German parliament passed the Nuremberg Race Laws. German Jews are stripped the of their citizenship. Laws makes Relations between Jews and non-Jews are forbidden. In Jews cannot employ non-Jews. German Jews are stripped of their citizenship. Relations between Jews and non-Jews are forbidden. Jews cannot employ non-Jews. One of the geniuses of of this policy because it's actually using something that's rational, legislation with something irrational, which is xenophobia. These laws set out to deny Jews in Germany their citizenship, regardless of how long a particular Jew has been living in Germany or that person's family. These laws and the laws ultimately define Jews in citizenship in Germany based upon who a person's a grandparents were by race. And therefore, anyone and the who had even one Jewish grandparent could no longer based be a upon who a person's Sexual relations by race. between Jews and, and Aryans was considered a crime because sexual no relations between Jews and Aryans obviously violated racial principles and would produce children who would Aryans be in some way carriers of the Jewish gene. The Nuremberg, Nuremberg Law separates the Jews out of German society and with that a sense of indifference uh, is engendered which ultimately would lead to you know, a sense of indifference to the Jewish faith at later stages that, of Nazi of Nazi the idea uh, that Jews are not equal to the rest of the German to, people, you know, the idea that Jews should not be equal to citizens, the, the idea that there should be a social separation Nazi legislated in Germany seemed to be at least unobjectionable to almost everybody else in Germany. And no one spoke out. The Nuremberg crimes were really uh, the crimes of the Nuremberg elites, judges, and lawyers, and faith leaders. No one and spoke educated out. The, the society that should have been uh, engaged the in Nuremberg protesting elites, against judges, Nuremberg racism and lawyers, were the and elites faith and the society that in effect were promulgating the this hate been and promulgating in these laws. Protesting against the Nuremberg, the Nuremberg laws were passed were in 1935. The and the society they were not passed as far as almost all historians this hate now agree with any intention these laws. or any vision of when the future the Nuremberg laws were passed in 1935. A murder they were not passed as far as what the Nazis later called the crime of the Jewish question. 
However, these laws ultimately served as the foundation for determining all policies against Jews, and that included, as time went on, also killing the Jews. The rise of Nazi Germany and the Nuremberg Laws are a stark reminder of how marginalization and the denial of basic human rights led to Auschwitz and the murder the rise of, of Nazi Germany people. and the Nuremberg laws it is are a, a stark reminder, reminder of how marginalization at our own and peril. the denial of basic human rights led to Auschwitz and the murder of millions of innocent people. It is a reminder we fail to heed at our own peril. So it was a very sobering, sobering video. That last line, a uh, reminder we fail to heed at our own peril, meaning that's a reminder that we can choose to ignore at our own risk is another way of putting that. Um, yeah, so let's move forward. Uh, so after the Nuremberg Laws, it basically became legal to be racist and anti-Semitic in Germany. Uh, we've talked before about Kristallnacht. Uh, this was the government mandated um, action against the Jewish people in Berlin. So this was in response to a 17 year old Jewish boy uh, who shot a German diplomat in Paris. Uh, this was a, a young Jewish teenager whose father had been greatly affected. His family had already been affected uh, by these Nuremberg laws and by things that were going on in Germany. Uh, so he took action and the German government, the Nazi government, uh, decided to use this to take a big action. November 9th, 1938, uh, we talked about this. this. We saw the government mandated attacks on Jewish homes, businesses, and synagogues. Um, fire crews worked to protect other buildings while Jewish businesses and synagogues burned. Uh, nearly 100 Jews uh, were murdered or killed in the violence on this night. And the streets were littered with glass, which brought the name Kristallnacht, uh, Night of the Broken Glass. And again, that was government mandated. The government said, do this. So, of course, the situation in Europe created a lot of Jewish ref refugees and a lot of isolation for them. Uh, before I get into that, I want to I want to take a look at this top picture here. Um, I found this picture yesterday and spent a lot of time looking at it. What, look at it for a second. What are these Jewish children doing? These are children of families who are on a boat from Europe to the United States, escaping, escaping the devastation in Europe. Uh, but what are they doing? And does that seem peculiar to you? They're doing what we recognize as the Nazi salute. Uh, what Germans um, and Nazis did to Hitler to honor him and praise him and salute his ideology. Now, if somebody did this today, they're automatically assumed to be a neo-Nazi, uh, racist, full of hate. That is not what these kids here have. Uh, they have found a way to salute their hope. They have taken that salute that meant such devastation in their homeland and they're saluting their hope uh, in a new land. And I just, that picture struck me. And I love that picture for that reason. But uh, yeah, that kind of, that sidetracked me for a little bit, but it's an important picture, I think, uh, that shows there's still hope in humanity, even when terrible things are going on. So Jews realized that violence was going to grow. Um, so they had a couple options. Many fled to other countries. Of course, some of those countries Hitler later conquered, and they were right back in the same situation. And unfortunately, many countries closed their doors after a while, including the United States. Um, so many Jewish refugees were trying to flee the country. Um, other countries began to worry about what that might mean for them. Um, so many Jews tried to leave and after a while had nowhere to go. And those who remained in Germany were forced into what are called ghettos. Uh, sometimes we use the term ghetto for a poor neighborhood, a rundown neighborhood today, but it comes from this time in World War II. You see that picture on the bottom. 
Jews were forced into small neighborhoods and then literally bricked in. Streets had walls down the middle of them where there didn't used to be walls. Uh, they were kept in by bricks and barbed wire. Germans hoped that the Jews would starve or die of disease as they were trapped in these neighborhoods. Uh, but the Jewish people were and are uh, a strong people. Uh, they went through a lot, but they pushed on and survived through, uh, many of them did, this ghetto living. That brings us to the final solution, um, which you have not, if you have not heard that term, it has a very negative connotation, and it will for you from now on. Hitler grew impatient just waiting for Jews to die uh, from starvation and disease in the ghettos. That was, that was not solving what he called the Jewish problem. So he began a genocide plan known as the final solution to the Jewish problem, or for short, the final solution. Uh, if you ever hear a reference to that term, that's usually what it's talking about. To protect what he called the purity of the Aryan race, the Germans, all subhumans had to be eliminated. Um, like there were pests, like you have someone to kill the bugs in your house. He wanted them to be eliminated, to be exterminated, because they were subhuman and were literally treated like pests that needed to be get, gotten rid of. So this included Roma, which we sometimes call gypsies, Poles, Russians, homosexuals, mentally ill, disabled, and the incurably sick, meaning people who had sicknesses and diseases that were not going to be cured. Uh, these were all people that Hitler determined no longer needed to live, at least not in Germany, because he did not want them uh, destroying the purity of the German race, the master race. And of course, the main target through all this was always the Jews, always the Jews. So killing squads um, under this order of the final solution took Jews to pits outside of towns, shot them and filled the pits and covered up the pits with dirt. Sometimes, sometimes not. Sometimes they just let, left pits full of bodies. Men, women, children, and infants were all killed. Uh, there was no mercy. There was no grace. There was no consideration for the young. If you were Jewish, if you were one of these groups of people that were considered impure, um, they wanted you gone um, in the most severe way. Jews who were not gathered by killing squads were taken to concentration camps. Uh, they worked seven days a week and were beaten or killed for not working fast enough. Um, I just read last night that many Jews lost uh, 40 to 50 pounds within the first uh, one or two months at one of these concentration camps. Um, their food for a day was often a small piece of stale bread, uh, maybe a potato skin, not even a potato, and some very thin soup or water. Um, but people were starving so much that if somebody spilled their soup in the dirt, People dug their spoons into the dirt uh, to eat the mud, trying to get anything uh, to survive. That tells you the survival mentality that the Jewish people had, even in these tough times. Um, you can see some of the thin, emaciated bodies there in that picture. You can only imagine going through something like that. But as it turned out, uh, for Hitler's liking, shooting Jews was taking too long. It was not something he was happy with. So Nazis built extermination camps in 1942, capable of killing 6,000 Jews a day. It's just, that's two 9-11s in one day, every day. It's, it's hard to imagine. Shower rooms were turned into gas rooms. Jews were told to strip for a shower and then pushed by hundreds into these shower rooms, but that it was not for a shower. Cyanide gas poured down from the shower heads and within minutes, everybody in these rooms was dead. The survivors. Six million European Jews died in these death camps or Nazi, Nazi massacres. Less than four million survived. I want you to take a look at this picture for a minute. And if you've ever studied the Holocaust, you've probably seen it or something like it before. These are wedding rings. 
taken from the Jewish people, often when they arrived at the camps or after they were killed at the camps. This is just one box of many boxes at many camps of rings. You know, we think about the big number, six million Jews died, but it has such a much greater effect than that. Each one of these rings is more than a life lost. It's a love lost. It's a family lost. It's family gatherings. It's family celebrations that won't happen anymore. It's children and grandchildren that won't be born. It's celebrations of life, each one of those replaced by meaningless death. And the Germans held these like trophies, the Nazis. Terrible. Let's think about that for a second. Some Jews were saved by non-Jews who hid them or helped them escape to neutral countries. Uh, we've, we've learned a little bit about Anne Frank. Uh, we saw the play at our school, which was amazing. Uh, it gave us a good idea of what it was like. And we saw people who hid Jews uh, and helped them. Um, and these people who helped did this at great risk to their own lives. Um, and it happened. There are many instances of this. There are some great movies out there you can look up. Um, Schindler's List is, of course, one of those. They're hard to watch, but they show some of the great sacrifices uh, that people did to help the Jewish people. So again, there's hope in the world. Hope has to come through. So I want to leave you with this. Uh, we're going to watch a little video here. It's a, a small reunion of some Holocaust survivors. Uh, back at the place where they were once imprisoned. You can see the emotion human imagination still struggles uh, to comprehend what was hearts. done here. Auschwitz. Um, where humanity comes face to face with its ultimate tough, capacity for evil. Let's watch this. More than a million people were victims of the Nazi genocide here. They were gassed. The human shot, imagination hanged, still struggles to comprehend what was done here. Men, Auschwitz, women, children. Babies. Where humanity comes face to face with its ultimate capacity for evil. More than a million people were victims there are of the voices Nazi that were never here. meant to be heard. Three hundred survivors gassed, are here for the anniversary, shot, hanged, but the voice of witness burned. is dwindling with time. Men, women, a decade children, ago, there were fifteen hundred. As an eleven-year-old prisoner, Mordecai Roman lost his mother, father, two sisters to the death chambers. There are voices that were never meant to be heard. Three hundred survivors are here for the anniversary. But the horror voice of reached its climax here, but it began for many in European ago, cities which they thought civilized, where they felt secure. As an eleven-year-old prisoner, Mordecai Ronan lost his mother and father, arrested two in Paris, to the death murdered in Auschwitz. I don't believe that I'm here. It's my it's own. It's my own. Her daughter Madeline escaped the round of French Jews by French police working for the Nazis. Where they felt secure. I stepped down in a cry. I cried. Say a Dugason, arrested in Paris, murdered in Auschwitz. At the moment, I want to show you. It's my own. It's finished for my mother. I never see her. Madeleine was hidden Madeline in the countryside the by the resistance. Her mother was taken here to Drancy, a suburb of Paris, from where the Vichy French state sent more than 60,000 Jews to Auschwitz. And I imagined my mother, and I imagined my aunt, imagined the old family died the same way, you know. Madeleine was hidden in the countryside by the resistance. Her mother was taken here to Drancy, a suburb of Paris, from where the Vichy French state sent more than 60,000 Jews to Auschwitz. Madeleine's mother was killed when Auschwitz was still in its early stages as an extermination centre. Gabor Hirsch was sent to Auschwitz with his family and last saw his mother towards the war's end. I wanted to give her my piece of a piece of Bread, bread. Madeline's mother was At killed end, when Auschwitz was still in its early stages as an extermination center. She gave me her portion. Gaber Hirsch was yeah, sent to Auschwitz with his family and last saw his mother mother's towards mother. the war's end. I wanted to Nearly a quarter of a million children were deported to Auschwitz. Bread, bread. From the security of family life to a place a of nightmares. Look. Uh, this Look. was the last time I saw my mother. You know, I was not 
Nearly yeah, quarter of a million children were pretty. deported to Auschwitz. I was not very strong. From the security of family life but to you a were place lucky. of nightmares. I was lucky, yes. What kept you alive? On the day of liberation, these children were photographed by a Soviet soldier. Among them, Gabor, 15 years old, he you weighed just over that. four stone. Very yes, clever. Very now, for the first time in 70 years, he's being reunited strong. with four other survivors from that photograph. It was, it was, I was lucky, Gabor yes. Hirsch. On the day of liberation, these children yeah. were photographed by a Soviet soldier. Yeah. Among them, Gabor, 15 years old, he weighed just over four stone. For the survivors, Auschwitz is a story of limitless loss. Now, for the first time in 70 years, he's being reunited with four other survivors from that photograph. What's your name? Gabor Hirsch. Sure, I know Gabor Hirsch. And for humanity, yeah. it represents a collective yeah. moral catastrophe whose warnings about ethnic, yeah. religious and racial hatred For the survivors, so often Auschwitz unheeded. is a story of limitless loss that they feel bound to tell and retell while they still can. And for humanity, it represents a collective moral catastrophe whose warnings about ethnic, religious and racial hatred go so often unheeded. So part of why we remember history, and we need to, is because the voices that can tell us that history are passing away. Uh, this is a gentleman named Ellie Weisel. He was about 15 years old when he was taken to the concentration camps. Um, I just want to read what he, he said to you. Never shall I forget the little faces of the children whose bodies I saw turned into wreaths of smoke beneath the silent blue sky. Never shall I forget those flames which consumed my faith forever. Never shall I forget those moments which murdered my God and my soul and turned my dreams to dust. Never. By Ellie Weisel. Passed away four years ago. Uh, he and people like him are not here anymore <clears throat> to tell us the story. There are a few, but the generation is slipping away before us. And that's this is why we study history. There are voices that need to be heard that once they're gone, we have to be their voices. Um, so we're, we're losing some great survivors who were fortunate enough to live to old age, but many were not. But these are the survivors that can tell the stories of being there, uh, the stories that we need to remember so we make sure that this doesn't happen again. Wow, so that's a tough lesson to go through, the Holocaust, and you could spend months and years studying it. This is just a very, very brief look at it but it's a look that we have to take. Um, and I want you to, to consider this as we study history and as you study history in years to come. There's a reason that we do it. It's to remember these people like Ellie, um, like the people in the videos telling their story. It's a story that needs to be heard. Um, that's how we honor and respect the people who 